we set off on our journey, we wanted someone to set the stage for us. And we've decided to ask Wendy Hodgson of the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix to start us off with a keynote speech that will take us from one end of Arizona to the other. Wendy is a senior research botanist at the Desert Botanical Garden, and she has spent her entire life pretty much in Arizona, traveling from one end of the state to the other, enjoying the diversity of the Arizona flora. During her time at the Desert Botanical Garden, she's worn many hats, including plant explorer, an evolutionary biologist, teacher, botanical illustrator, and she's also an ethnobotanist. In 2001, she published a wonderful book, which you may be familiar with, called Food Plants of the Sonoran Desert. And this is a wonderful example of her um, knowledge in ethnobotany because it covers the plants in this part of the world that were useful and important to indigenous and, and traditional cultures in this part of the world. Wendy is also passionate about botanical education and she likes to share her knowledge with others. And so she's gonna do that for us tonight. She's going to talk about the major ecoregions and biotic communities in Arizona with some favorite and representative plants that she's chosen to share with you. We look forward to your talk, Wendy. Well, thank you so much, Lynn, for that really nice introduction. I want to thank uh, uh, the organizers of this symposium. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to, to speak tonight. So I'm going to talk, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, the various ecoregions in Arizona, highlighting plants that are near and dear to me, uh, including representative plants uh, within that ecoregion, plants that are rare, endemic, uh, plants that we're doing research on, um, and just plants that I just think are really cool. So I came across this poster um, and it was so detailed with all of the ecoregions within the US. And so you see here, there are seven that are uh, designated for Arizona. So the first one is Colorado Plateau. And what, what we need to remember here, the actual province of the Colorado Plateau is, is outlined in red. So their concept of ecoregion is different uh, from the, the uh, Colorado Plateau province. But nevertheless, this is, uh, uh, if you looked at David Brown et al's biotic communities, this would include Great Basin, Desert Scrub, and Conifer Woodland. So for each equal region, I, I include David Brown et al's uh, biotic communities in, in, uh, with this. So this is a beautiful area of tablelands, steep cliffs, canyons, mesas, plateaus, mountains, uh, PJ and G uh, Gamble Oak woodlands, and then you have low-lying areas with saltbrush and blackbrush coleogeny communities that aren't found in the higher elevations of the adjacent Arizona New Mexico plateau. And some of my favorite plants and representative of this region is Bailey's yucca, uh, this close up of the flowers, yucca bailei, all the rabbit brushes, the genus Ericomeria, like Ericomeria nauseosa and the gazillion varieties of that. And what used to be Wyethia scabra, mule's ears, now Scabrethia uh, scabra, very characteristic plant. And you can see often growing in these sand dunes. Rosemary mint, it's in the mint family. It's a very aromatic shrub. Oleomintha in Canada is common in that area. And these cuties, uh, these are rather rare. They're uh, very indicative of Colorado Plateau region, Cryptantha capitata, which is a perennial Cryptantha. And this very showy Asclepius, Asclepius cryptoceris, which uh, reaches its southernmost distribution uh, in northern Arizona. And by the way, the best place to see this eco region in Arizona is from about Fredonia going east to Vermilion Cliffs, Priya Plateau, and Priya Canyon. You have these bush pea vines, Lathyrus eucosmus, Lathyrus brachycalyx, very, very showy. And in this region, too, you have seeps and springs where you find unique plants, including very often Rigbird's thistle. And this thistle is big. Uh, the inflorescence can reach up to three meters tall. And by the way, that picture of me, uh, I was about 40 years younger in that picture. Find the little columbines. This is the little Aquilegia micrantha, as well as the desert columbine, Aquilegia desert torum. And this interesting plant, it's called Caladium californica, and it's California sawgrass. It's not a grass, it's in the sedge family. And this is of interest to, because uh, so much habitat has been lost with groundwater prop pumping, but also with the construction of Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, the well-known botanist Dan Welch was very concerned with this plant and said that just 
all the populations, majority of populations within Glen Canyon were, uh, were destroyed. And he suggested that this be a species of concern. And in the dry areas, uh, often in sandy areas, you find these rare species, the house rock fishhook cactus found only in vermilion cliffs and the Sclepius welshii, Welsh's milkweed. And An Andrea will talk more about this species and others in Northern Arizona tomorrow night. Uh, Welch's milkweed is a federally listed species and you can't confuse it with any other broadleaf milkweed when you see all those little prickles on the, on the fruit, very diagnostic. Uh, this spurge was first described in the 70s from Marble Canyon. It's since been found in Vermilion Cliffs and that beautiful illustration by Susan uh, depicts this. These illustrations and, and of these plants will be featured in a book on Grand Canyon rare and sensitive and special plants. So you'll see some more illustrations. Uh, another uh, plant, I love yuccas. Um, this is the cannab yucca. It has a very limited distribution just around cannab. It does get into Arizona, loves sandy areas. We're keeping an eye on this one. Uh, some of us at the garden, we, we are on the IUCN assessment team. Uh, assessing agaves and yuccas, and this is one that we are assessing for vulnerability or for rarity in the red list assessment. Unfortunately, the city of Kanab approved plans to uh, harvest sand nine miles north of Kanab, which happens to be the type of locality of the species, and the harvesting of the sand is for fracking operations, so we'll keep an eye on that. So moving now next to the Arizona and New Mexico plateaus, uh, Again, you can see the, the uh, biotic communities of David Brown et al., Great Basin Conifer Woodland, Grassland, Desert Scrub. Um, this again, too, is in the Colorado province of the Colorado Plateau, except for the right there in Gunnison Valley. Uh, this is a big, uh, very diverse region. It's, uh, they divided into 16 sections, and one of these sections is Grand Canyon, a uh, place very near and dear to me. We've done a lot of research in Canyon. I'd just like to show you some of the plants in this region and some of the plants that we're working on too. Uh, Fremont dahlia is a very attractive uh, dahlia. It's actually a species of the Mojave Desert as well. Um, Noton's hophorn bean uh, exists as a relic species found in north facing uh, uh, side canyons uh, within the canyon. And you see another beautiful illustration by Sandy Tarico of that species. Uh, the Sonoran Desert counterpart of Encelia is Encelia resinifera. It has two different subspecies, and this is resinifera resinifera. And by the way, we really need some good photographs of the species. And uh, also this uh, mustard princess plume, very showy in flower, Stanley Panana, very characteristic uh, of, of the region. Another favorite of mine is in the gentian family, Frasera paniculata. It has a rosette of light green leaves that have white margins on the outer part of the leaves and uh, this big panicle of yellow flowers. And the one on the right I became very interested in, um, this is a type of evening primrose, variety crinida. It's common in Utah and it reaches its southernmost distribution in the Grand Canyon region. It's a little guy, very tufted, and it grows on these like Badlands tufted soil. It, it loves that kind of soil. It's only found there. And of course, we have our seeps and springs, and there's a good chance that you're going to find the giant helibore orchid at the Pactus giganteus, which Sandy Tarico also illustrated uh, for our upcoming book. Another plant that likes water, seeps and springs, and it's also found along the Colorado River is satin tail. I became interested in this one. It used to have a wide distribution from Texas to California, but again, because of groundwater pumping, uh, its distribution is much less than, than uh, formerly. And the Grand Canyon region is a refuge for the species. Most of the populations occur there now. And one of the problems too was for whatever reason, it was listed as a noxious weed. It was confused with another species of Imperata, Imperata cylindrica. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on that one. And some of the succulents, uh, plains prickly pear on the left, they come in a variety of color from light yellow to yellow to pink. I like the picture on the top because those flowers are sticking out of sand, uh, the sand dunes. Um, <clears throat> and the one in the middle, this is a cotton top or many headed barrel cactus. It used to be in the genus Echinocactus, Echinocactus polycephala variety, Xeranthomoides. And if you look at the distribution, it's in yellow. And Andrew and I are uh, working on this. Uh, 
uh, on this species, and the variety polycephala is in blue. Uh, we think that, that this variety xeranthamoid should be elevated to species status. And on the right there, Sclerocactus parviflora, small flowered fish cook. This was a species that was named by Elzada Clover and Lois Jodder back on their epic journey as the first women to successfully go down the Colorado River in 1938. And they collected specimens and named this as a new species. Then you find some weird ones. This one's been called Nolina microcarpa, bear grass. But as you can see, it's pretty different from the ones we've seen in Southern Arizona. And it's probably uh, diverse diverging and you know someday it might uh, be recognized thousands of years from now as a, a distinct taxon who, who knows and we have our kaibab agave this is found in the upper half of, of Grand Canyon uh, it's generally solitary and it's very big and as you go further south down river or uh, further west down river you pick up the Utah agave subspecies Utah and so it's, it's just magnificent plants Yuccas, uh, many yuccas, and we're still, we're trying to figure these out too. Of course, we have our banana yucca that produces the banana-like fruits, and then Utah yucca, Utah, yucca utahensis that produces these dried capsules. And then this other one that I just saw again last week, I've been keeping an eye on this one for probably 26 years. Uh, I think it might be a new species. It's a dry capsule, uh, produces dry capsules. What's interesting too is that they hybridize with the the bacot species, uh, yucca bacata, and, and this is a hybrid uh, hybridization event that people think just doesn't occur in nature, and it sure does occur, and quite frequently as well. So you get these plants with these bizarre fruits. Um, new species are being described in this region, as well as elsewhere. These are two menzelias that I and colleagues described as new. They're stickle leaves from the, from the canyon, only found in the canyon region. Uh, they're white flowered, which is very unusual because most of the menzelias, the stipulis have yellow flowers. And you look at the distribution, it's quite distinct too. Um, very different, uh, canyonensis in the red, while the pyensis on the, in the blue. And no doubt with further exploration, they grow in really difficult areas to, to uh, explore and collect from. We'll fill in uh, with more dots. And of course, we have the beautiful illustrations. So a lot of seeps, a lot of springs, and a lot of thistles. Uh, this one on the left was, uh, I first saw this back in 1994, I think, and, and, and people called it Ridberg's thistle uh, one in Utah, but I, it, I looked at it and said, it's not. And, and the plant, I swear, is talking to me and says, look into this more, Wendy. Uh, it's found in Buck Farm and South Canyon. And Shannon Fieldberg at the garden and Jennifer Ackerfield at Denver Botanical Garden and doing molecular work and showed that it is not even related at all to Ridberg's thistle. So we think it's new and we'll be describing that as a new species. And the one on the right is up on Cliff Springs off the North Rim that's been called Arizona thistle. And again, molecular work and morphological uh, work is showing that this too is a new species, brand new to science that we'll be uh, describing as well. This is the Grand Canyon beaver tail cactus. It's very different from our regular beaver tail that we see down in our neck of the woods down here and around Yuma. <clears throat> and you can see the glockids are very pronounced and the aerials are well separated apart. Uh, it has a very limited distribution confined to Grand Canyon. What is interesting that uh, Lucas Majur and Raul Puente have been doing a lot of work on the, what we call the Opuncha basilaris or beaver tail complex. And so I'll make sense of the, all these dots here. So. Up here is a, a, a group of plants that have been called uh, Puncha halii. Uh, some people consider it a variety of uh, Longeria lata. Some people thought it was the same as Longeria lata, but actually it is unique. And what uh, Lucas's research is showing that either the ancestor to halii or halii itself is the center of origin of this whole complex of Basilaris. And there was a north to south migration for the species so then you pick up Longeria lata and evolving later and in, in migrating in, into uh, Opuntia basilaris, variety basilaris, the one that's so common that we see around, uh, around here. So really neat research uh, that's going on with, with that. So let's shift now to the Mojave Desert. <clears throat> uh, in Arizona, you find it up around Kingman area and a tiny bit in Southwest Utah in the Beaver Dam Mountains in Southern and, uh, Nevada and California. And it's characterized by these broad basins and scattered 
mountains uh, very well uh, illustrated in Death Valley, where you have very tall mountains. <coughs> uh, this area is uh, cre dominated by creosote bush, Joshua trees, barrel cacti, and on alkali flats, you have salt bush and salt grass, and all these other species that like these alkali conditions. And then in the region in the higher elevations, you get PJ, pinyon juniper, ponderosa pine, all the way up to bristlecone pine as well. But definitely the iconic plant of Mojave Desert is Joshua tree. Lee Lenz did a paper uh, and recognized two different species, uh, Western Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia, which you see as a very distinctive single uh, trunk. The flowers are very unusual. They're round, they close in on each other. And if you look at this, uh, even the pistol in the style, they're quite unique from this one, the one you're more familiar with probably, the Eastern Joshua tree, Yucca Jaegeriana. You can see the growth habits different, flowers are very different, and you can see here in the comparison too. Growth habit and the flowers, even the flower style is different, uh, and even the pollinators are different. There's two distinct pollinators for these two species, and um, uh, Jillian's going to talk more about yucca pollination on uh, Wednesday night, so, but fascinating story. Also, the distribution is different. The dark uh, uh, represents yucca brevifolia, and the lighter shade represents Jaegeriana. And there is a point of contact where they do hybridize right in the middle. You can see that arrow. Uh, other iconic species is yucca shadidra, the Mojave yucca. Uh, also, again, yucca utahensis up in the beaver dam, some of the cacti, uh, the many-headed barrel cactus, this time instead of xeranthamoides, it's variety polycephala. And then Opuntia curvispina, which is actually a hybrid between Opuntia peacantha and the pancake prickly pear, Opuntia chlorotica. California barrel cactus are really common throughout, throughout the Mojave Desert. Uh, this little fuzzy little prickly pear is adorable. Uh, it was just named not too long ago as a new species, Opuntia deplorosina, which is found up in the Lake, lake Mead area. And my favorite choya has to be Cylindral Puncho bisei, the Peach Springs Canyon choya which was originally only known from Peach Springs Canyon in the western end of Grand Canyon, but now we know it occurs farther up, up river in the canyon and all the way to Lake Mead. And of course, we've got this beautiful illustration by Leighton Altgren on it. This little cutie is in the poppy family, Arctomecon californica. Uh, Art Phillips told me about populations in the Grand Canyon circled in blue, and he felt that these were different from the from the rest of the populations in, in uh, mostly in California there. Um, and so we want to do further, further work. And this has conservation implications too, because it's basically almost cut the distribution of one species in half. So now you've got two more rare taxa, if indeed this represents a either new variety or a new species. So this is something we want to work, work on, work with Wallapai Nation as well as Grand Canyon National Park. I had to include this one. This has got to be one of the cutest plants I've ever seen. It was actually taken in Death Valley, but it's a different species of Arctomecon, Miriamii. And it's different from Californica. It has white flowers instead of the yellow flowers. But look at the distribution though. Glenn Rink observed it very close to Arizona. And I think we need to find this plant in Arizona. Uh, in the Mojave Desert, you have a lot of springs and seeps. This is taken. Uh, up uh, off the Virgin River near Mesquite. And as you can see, uh, uh, with these springs, you have these big tall thistles. Uh, and this is my friend, Austin Rosen, who has decided to do his grad work on thistles, this group. Uh, they've been called either Mojave thistle or the Virgin River thistle, Virginensis. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to figure this out and uh, we'll be working on that together. And included in this, group is these plants that Glenn Rink and I think is a new species that's on the west end of the Grand Canyon that's been called Circe mojavensi. And of course, this has to, this takes us into other areas where plants that were also called mojavensi, and it takes us darn to Death Valley. I, I, I love doing this work, it takes you to all these different areas. And so we're going to be looking, uh, Austin and us will be looking at this uh, populations too, and perhaps there might be uh, new, new species, cryptic taxa within this. But my all-time favorite plant, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one, is this guy. Let's grow yucca newberry. I call it newberry's mock yucca. 
just the common name indicates that it's not a true yucca. And for a long time, it was considered a yucca. And as you can see there, at one time, six different uh, subspecies of yucca whiplii were recognized. But uh, as it turns out, Hespero yucca is not at all related to yucca. Uh, it's closely related instead to Hesper aloe. Uh, three species are recognized as based on the work by Karen Clary. So you have Hespero yucca nuberii on the upper right corner. And you can see the habitat is very dry. This is in the Grand Canyon region. And it produces a term from the terminal bud a flower stalk and, it's, uh, and it dies when it flowers and a single stem. And on the lower left is Hespero yucca whiplii, which uh, can produce multiple stems, can produce uh, flowering stalks from uh, axillary or terminal buds. So sometimes it dies and sometimes it doesn't die. And then the lower right is Hespero yucca peninsularis, which is this, has these short fat leaves. And it's the one you see around Catavina. So it grows in the Sonoran Desert. So, but the one we're concerned with that we want to talk about is Hespero yucca nuberii. And there aren't very many collections. There are not many too crazy people that will go after this plant. So the plant, if it's not, you know, grows along the river, which is difficult to get. But also, this is typical habitat. And there's a plant right there. That's where it grows on, typically. So when you try to collect and make specimens, of it, uh, you have to be pretty in, uh, inventive and be really careful so that you don't fall off a cliff. Um, back in 84, Richard Felger collected this plant uh, way down on the Mexico-Arizona-Sonora uh, border. And uh, 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 three of us, Raul, Andrew, and I went down to check it out. And because of, of uh, Richard's excellent directions, we found the population. It looks like Hespero yucca nuberii. And one of the characteristics besides it dying when it flowers and being a single rosette are the absence of what we call placental wings in the fruit. Uh, Whiplii has very conspicuous wings, and, and this one doesn't. But we want to do some molecular work and see where it falls out. So one of the questions is, what factors and events resulted in, in, the, in the kind of distribution that we see today? And these are the kind of questions that we love to try to figure out. Um, so for example, did Pleistocene events uh, affect the distribution as we see it? And result of what we see today. So there's glacial, interglacial episodes going on during the Pleistocene. During glacial periods, there's a cooling. And so there's probably a lot of uh, sharing of pollen, gene exchange, everything's hunky-dory, uh, the climate's great. Um, and so the populations aren't being fragmented. But then you have the interglacial periods when there's a warming trend and plants may not like that and not doing so well, dying, and then you get fragmenting of populations and there's less uh, gene exchange and you get isolation of populations, which can lead to speciation, can also lead to uh, loss of uh, populations or plants that, that uh, retreat to refugia. So, and then you add to that, the, the fossil record, uh, Ken Cole and Tom Van Deveren are showing that the plants, dis many of the plants disappeared looking at, uh, uh, pack rat middens, many of the plants disappeared 11, 12,000 years ago. So what you see now is, is this distribution of both the species and, and their distribution here. So uh, Seagraves and Palmyre did an interesting study in looking at the pollinating moths. Now they're, all the Hespero yucca are pollinated by one species, Stegeticula maculata, but there's two subspecies, subspecies maculata, which pollinates California's northern whippleii. And then you have subspecies extrania, which pollinates California's southern uh, <clears throat> whiplii, as well as the northern Baja California whiplii, as well as the Hespero yucca peninsularis on Baja. And then they looked at the Grand Canyon ones, and it was very confusing. Uh, it showed similarities to extrania, but they believed that the Grand Canyon ones were being isolated from others for at least 11,000 years. And possibly it's diverging enough that someday it will become its own subspecies. <clears throat> but they also concluded that moths and plants development and distribution is related to glacial and interglacial activities. One of the questions that we have too is, well, maybe they diverged before the Pleistocene. Um, the question is, were, were the Colorado River lakes and embayments isolating barriers to seed dispersal or to uh, pollen dispersal by pollinators? And we know that between two and six million years ago, there was the beginning of an integrated lower Colorado River um, <clears throat> from Hoover Dam down to Yuma. 
So there's a connection all the way to the Gulf of the Colorado River that time period. We also know that there was a, an embayment called the Bouse embayment that formed about four to nine million years ago. And so were these physical barriers to seed or pollinator dispersal, um, there's been animal studies and it's shown and it's believed that the Mojave and Sonoran desert tortoises uh, diverge as a result of, of these physical barriers, these waterways. Uh, and this is an example of what we call allopatric speciation by vicariance, where you have a population of the physical barrier, it could be a mountain, could be rivers or, or such as embayments will separate the populations and they, and, and they could evolve into new species, different unique gene pools or be lost totally or retreat to refugia. So there actually was a study, there's hardly any on plants, but uh, Chris Smith and his colleagues looked at yucca, the Joshua trees and believe uh, that this, these waterways did indeed impede dispersal of the seed, but not the pollinators. And uh, the yuccas probably diverged, they think maybe four or five million years ago, and the pollinators diverged um, much more recently, maybe one million years ago. <clears throat> so we don't really know. A uh, few things that suggested that Hespero yucca diverged about 16 million years ago and um, its active pollinator ancestor, very, very old. And the uh, two subspecies diverged about nine to 10 million years ago. By the way, this plant on the right, it formed its inflorescence within two weeks. Very, very quick development of the inflorescence. So looking at that distribution, it's unusual. Uh, we have plants in the Mojave and then you find these outliers in the Sonoran Desert near the Arizona Sonora border. And you see it in this pattern in other species, Yekashidudra, many-headed barrel, and also Molina bigelovii. And it'd be interesting to look at other species to see it's that similar patterns. So let's move on now to the Arizona, New Mexico mountains, Mogollon Highlands. Um, <clears throat> This is, uh, this is an area that is very diverse. 11 of the 26 biotic communities are found here from Chaparral to PJ to Oak Woodlands and up to Old Growth Ponderosa Pine Forest. So Carl and Joan will talk in far more depth uh, on tomorrow night. Um, <clears throat> very diverse area, diverse geologically, diverse uh, faunal and floral diversity. It's really a hot spot. And this caught my attention too. It's, an, it's a region neglected by scientists. And I know uh, Kirsten Allman is working with uh, part of, with Forest Service and citizen scientists and developing programs to, to focus on this region and do uh, floristic work. <clears throat> they, I love this publication, Plant Press, and it devoted a whole issue to the Mogollon Highlands uh, 2017 issue. Wonderful articles in this, I highly, highly recommend. So some of the plants that you find here, the manzanitas, the yerba santa, Eriodictyon augustifolium, and cliff rose, uh, the weird from Monodendron Californica, and they have such a dis weird disjunct distribution in central Arizona and then California. Some of the succulents, you have narrow leaf yucca, uh, and Corphantha vivipara, um, as well as these endemics. We need a photo of this one, Hymenopappus radiata. This is the white ray, white rayed woolly white. Uh, so our only white rayed hymenopapus in the state, very rare. Uh, also, we have the endemic oak creek triplet lily and uh, Dudleya saxosa variety colomi as endemics. In addition, Rusby's milkwort found in Verde Valley does get up into towards Kingman and also Horseshoe Dam area. And Yavapai claret cup hedgehog that Mark Baker had described not too long ago. And this little guy, we got to remember that the North Kaibab is part of this ecoregion. And uh, this little Pediocactus paradinii is very rare up there. This is a plant that Andrew and I became interested in. And those are millimeters, by the way. So I'm moving down to the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, this is a big desert, it extends uh, from the Madrian Archipelago to the Edwards Plateau. And in Arizona, it's the northern portion of the southernmost desert in North America, it extends a great deal into Mexico. Uh, predominantly desert grassland and arid shrub land, but you do get in the higher eleva elevations of oak, juniper, and pinyon pine woodland. But the characteristic plant of this region is oak tree yucca, yucca elata, variety yucca elata, and some other plants that I really like that are found in this region, small flowered sand puff, it's in the four o'clock family, and uh, black brush, if it shouldn't be confused with coleogeny, this is a whole different critter. 
uh, or American tar work, Florenzia cernio, which is an indicator species of the Chihuahuan Desert, and a few other ones here, chocolate flower, uh, Vinorama, and Acacia neomexicana, and Accordia nana, uh, which is also a Sonoran desert species. Uh, this plant, Accordia nana, is a rhizomatous perennial. It doesn't get much taller than your hand's breadth. Uh, it likes to grow under mesquites. And it's interesting, the Acamelato on the Gila River Pino, according to Amadeo Rea, calls this plant coyote cottonwood because the leaves are a lot like cottonwood and the fluff is sort of like the cottonwood seeds. Um, and then with cacti, you have the club choyas, Usonia emerii, Opuncha macrocentra, Opuncha patsii, as well as Fendler's hedgehog cactus too. And moving over to the Madrean archipelago, the Sky Islands, which we're going to hear much more with, from Sue and Jack later this evening, um, forms in basins and ranges. And the basins of are composed of, of Grandma Tobosa steppes and the ranges of oak juniper woodlands. And this would uh, include David Brown's uh, bio communities, uh, biotic communities of Madrean evergreen forests and woodland and semi desert grassland and Chihuahuan desert scrub. It goes up in elevation all the way to over 10,000 feet and home to bristlecone pine in an area of high diversity and endemism because it's a bridge between the Rockies and the Sierra Madre Occidental. If you're into oaks, this is the place to go. There's so many oaks and uh, so are Arizona Bedron. Uh, this is one of my favorites, a different kind of sumac, Rus microphylla, different agaves, agave peria botrucensis, and this Picture is a lowland form, probably anthropogenic. Uh, people brought in, brought the plants into this region versus the wild forms that are found up in the mountains. Emoli, agave shadii, variety shadii, and palmer's agave, um, species that Andrew and I are looking at, uh, come in very different color forms, yellows and uh, purples as well. And two of my favorite plants, I have a lot of favorite plants, as you probably noticed. Uh, Amaruxia palmatifida and Amaruxia gonzalesia in the cocosperm family called Saya. Uh, palmatifida is a more common species uh, throughout southern, much of southern Arizona, gets into uh, northern central uh, Mexico. Gonzalesia is much more rare, a few, few localities in Arizona, and some in Sonora and, get, and uh, northern Sinaloa as well. And, and they have different fruit characteristics and seed characteristics. Every single part of the plant is edible. It has these underground store, uh, tuber-like roots that you can eat uh, raw or roasted. The young fruits are edible. The young seeds, the young uh, or mature seeds are edible as well. The flowers are edible. The herbage is edible. All the parts are edible. And also, thanks to Tom Van Devender and uh, uh, Ana Lilia Viena, um, uh, they ran into this gentleman, Armando, who was making these wood carvings, and, and they noticed that the seeds of Gonzalesii were being used for the eyes. And so the gentleman, Armando, showed them populations uh, of Gonzalesii, which increased our knowledge of where this plant grows. So this is just an example of how we need to tap into to, uh, indigenous people's knowledge, as well as people who have lived on the landscape for generations and know the plants really well. Too often we neglect that. But you don't want to confuse the Amorexias with these guys, Tetrophora macrorhiza, the nettle spurge, narrow leafed cassava, Maniata gustaloba, and especially this one, the Gascalus and Gustadins, the Malamuhair. And all three of them grow with uh, Amorexias too. So the cacti, Wright's pincushion, uh, Santa Rita prickly pear, and this bizarre uh, Nolina, people have called it Nolina microcarpa. Uh, some of us call it Texana. This requires some work to do with this one. Um, other cacti, Corophantha recurvata, rainbow hedgehog, um, McDougall's pincushion, compass barrel, and the beautiful one in flower, uh, cane choya. Yuccas are plentiful down there, and uh, we're trying to figure those out as well. Again, we have yucca elata and yucca shadii. Uh, this is shots yucca. Some people are calling this yucca madrensis. Uh, Andrew and I think that it indeed is yucca shadii. This is a species that we'll be uh, looking at. Um, this is approximate distribution of it. In addition, we also find yucca, what we're calling yucca arizonica. Uh, Susan McKelvey in the 1930s named this species. 
And it's been uh, synonymized in, uh, under Yucca Baccata of our Ibrophilia. But again, Andrew and I think there's something to Susan's concept of the species. It's, it appears quite different from Yucca Baccata of And it produces the fleshy fruits like Baccata and like uh, Shadi Eye does too. And here's proximate distribution. And then this one too, another one that Susan McKelvey named Yucca Thornberry. This grows, as you can see, it's a much more drier habitat. It grows around Tucson. Uh, this too has been uh, uh, synonymized under Yucca Baccata brevifolia. Um, this is approximate distribution. So this, these are plants that we, we're working on with Raul Quente and Karen Clary, Karen Clary and others as well, and try to sort out the systematics of this plant, of these plants, of these yuccas. And then finally, the uh, Sonoran Basin and Range Eco Region, and uh, in Arizona, uh, this is uh, equivalent to Lower Colorado Valley and Arizona Upland. Um, <clears throat> this th this desert is uh, unique in that it has such a great number of types of life forms and diversity of plant communities, as shown here. Uh, this is an example of Arizona Upland, and and Philip will be talking greater detail um, uh, tomorrow night on, on this part of the Sonoran Desert. Um, and then this is an example of the lower Colorado Valley of Sonoran Desert and, and Valerie and Karen will be talking in much more detail about this part of the Sonoran Desert tomorrow night as well. And I have to put in this, this is Forest Shreve's uh, work. Um, and you're probably familiar with this. This is my go-to. Uh, reference when I want to learn more about the Sonoran Desert. It's not my only, but it is definitely a big one. Uh, there's so many gems in, in Forest Tree's discussion of the vegetation of the Sonoran Desert. Just a, a few plants that are my, some of my favorites in the Lower Colorado Valley region. Uh, Highly leaf burst sage. It grows in some of the driest habitat, uh, dry, rocky washes. Uh, Roos carnii, subspecies carnii, carni sumac, only known, it's probably a relictual species, it's hanging on in these north-facing uh, drainages and slopes, um, and it's found just around the Tinajas Altus in, in Arizona and into Sonora. There are two other subspecies that are found in, in Baja, California. And I'm a fan of Phacelias. This is one of the more unusual Phacelias, Phacelia neglecta, alkali Phacelia. It grows in one of the driest areas of, uh, of, of, the, of, of the US, I swear. It grows in desert pavement. And uh, interestingly, it has these succulent root storage organs. Uh, they, I think they store water. The leaves are very uh, thick. Um, and they have little white flowers. And so it has these adaptations. I'm sure people have studied this, but I think it would be really cool to find out how it does in such an arid environment. Uh, another plant that does well. Do this, Wendy. Okay, it I is Calis undulata aho lily, and it too has these underground storage organs, and they're edible as well. Uh, some of the species uh, Arizona Live Forever, Dudley Arizonica. Uh, Graham's pincushion, which is actually a Chihuahuan and Sonoran Desert uh, species with a disjunct populations in Grand Canyon, and Mammillaria tetrancystra, the corky pincushion, uh, which is a Sonoran Mojave species, and it has the corky strophial that's on the on the big seeds. And there's a lot of cool choyas: silver choya, diamond choya, teddy bear choya, buckhorn choya, and finally this plant, which is a really cool plant, Phalisma sonori. It occurs in the sand dunes around Yuma and just across the border. And if you look really carefully, that's the plants right there. Uh, they're parasitic on uh, woody shrubs and the sunflower and, and buckwheat families. These are pictures by Irony Pajek um, that uh, she graciously allowed me to use to show uh, tonight. And uh, Annette McGivney is going to write an article on this species with Irony's uh, uh, photographs for an upcoming Arizona highway. So be on the lookout for that. But it's during the spring when these receptacles, the flowers are developed from, appear. And it's in the Linoa family, Linoaceae. It is very rare. Uh, and this is what it looks like underneath. Um, it's a very succulent rhizome, full of moisture, 87% moisture, and also carbohydrates and various starches. 
As a matter of fact, the, uh, it was a very important food to the Hichet Atum, the San Papagos, who the Europeans and white people nicknamed the sand root, cr cr sand root crushers. Um, they would eat them uh, raw or roasted, and they actually taste really good. And it was actually uh, a chieftain who, who was uh, traveling with uh, Colonel Andrew Gray. Uh, and he saw the plants, jumped off his horse, and, uh, and started digging and, and produced these rhizomes and roasted them up and gave them to Colonel Gray. And, and Colonel Gray thought they were really good tasting uh, and enjoyed it. And that's, that's how it was introduced to the scientific world, uh, as well as, as to you know, non-Indigenous uh, people. The irony of this is it is very rare now, and it's believed by many that uh, using the plants, harvesting for food increased the population of these plants. And so when the Ichidatum were kicked out of the area, people believe that the plants are fewer and fewer in number. And this is an area where there's a lot of agricultural activities going on. And so Gary Navian and I did try to get it listed at Fish and Wildlife Service, but at that time, this was many years ago, the plants, unfortunately, were popping up in agriculture, newly developed agricultural fields. So they said, well, it's doing great, but I doubt they're doing well now. This is a close sister of, of that species, Phalisma arenarium. You can see there's a difference in the, in the, in the uh, flower inflorescence. Uh, inflorescence. Um, it has a wider distribution than Sonori, and it does have the edible rhizomes. Uh, I don't find them as tasty enough, uh, but... Uh, so I want to end with this thought too, um, that there, there's so much that we don't know what's going on out there and we can't do science as lone wolves. We need to collaborate with people. We need to collaborate with other scientists, with citizen scientists, with land management agency staff, and above all with indigenous people and those who, uh, who have lived in the landscape for a long, long time. Uh, and only then will we be answering more questions and only then will we be knowing what questions to ask too. I've been very, I'm very grateful to work and continue working with Hualapai Nation as well as Grand Canyon National Park and, and others so uh, wonderful people and very grateful too to uh, be working at the Desert Botanical Garden that allows me to do all these forays into the hinterlands. So with that, uh, and, uh, thank you very much for for first for coming and uh, for allowing me to share some of, some of my favorite plants. So thank you. Thanks so much, Wendy. That was really a whirlwind tour of the botany and the special plants throughout Arizona. Really fun stuff. Um, and one of the questions is actually kind of relevant to your last comments. One, one of our listeners asks, how does the average human participate in conservation and work projects like you're doing? Do you need to have a higher degree? How do you connect with this community? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, you don't need a degree. It helps, but be careful uh, that if you start volunteering or becoming involved with the PAPHAS project, that uh, you will not turn back and, and fall in love with, with botany, which may indeed lead you to uh, getting a degree in botany, but uh, getting involved with PAP has, uh, is a really great start and, uh, and being a part of, Na of Native Plant Society and other societies, uh, well, plant societies and, and meeting people, it just continues to develop and keeping your mind and, and eyes open and ears open. We had another question. Um, a viewer wanted to know why do you consider why do you call it the Mogian Central Mogian Plateau and not the Central Plateau? It, it's it, it's also called Central Highlands. There are so many names. Uh, there's several names for that area, uh, but that's yeah, that's proper too. Uh, in this particular that poster that I had showed here, that's what they called that. But if again, if you look at that uh, publication, the uh, of uh, the plant press, I call it Central Highlands. There, there's several names. Okay. Another question about the aho lily. What portions of the aho lily are edible? Those underground storage organs, those, those corm-like underground storage organs. So you can eat them raw. They're gritty. Just uh, you know, they grow in sand, or you can roast them too. And they're sort of mucilaginous. You can cook them, roast them, or eat them raw. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question asking you to clarify, what is the PAPAS PAC, a project? 
Hap has. Uh, as uh, Doug was mentioning earlier, it's a wonderful project. Stands for Plant Atlas Project of Arizona. And actually started, I think, around 2008. It was an idea that Andrew Salomon, Ralph Puente, and I had driving back from San Diego. It was based on a program, San Diego Museum of His Natural History started in utilizing and in, in teaching in, in uh, citizen sciences. Uh, people that had no background whatsoever in botany and making them botanists and doing floras. And so we thought, well, instead of doing it for San Diego County like they did, let's do it for the whole state of Arizona. And so that, that's when it started. And we offered uh, programs, uh, botany boot camps, two days uh, each way back then. And they still continue. And as Doug mentioned, we do it in Tucson. We do it here in Phoenix, up in uh, Flagstaff and other parts. So. Uh, so the best way to know is to, to contact your, uh, your um, chapter president and say, I'm really interested in it, or put your name down and we get enough people interested, we'll have these botany boot camps. And, and, and that will lead to doing your own floras, also uh, looking into doing rare plant monitoring and surveying as well. So really, uh, it's such a big help in utilizing citizen scientists. Yeah. Great. And one more question, how can we share with everyone the benefits of our desert native plants without putting them at risk from extractivism? The double-edged sword. Um, that's, a, that's a great question and it's a difficult one. Um, you know, we believe in the power of education um, and so, and it's slow and, you know, it, it's, it's a slow process and up against such uh, impacts uh, that are very quick. Um, there's no easy answer to that except to reach out to many people. And again, citizen scientists, another advantage uh, or uh, great thing that citizen scientists offer is they vote, is we all vote, so you can vote. Uh, once you learn of these, uh, of the value of saving plants, you vote for your senators and other legislators. That is the key way of doing that. But it, but it's 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 difficult. Thanks again, Wendy, for your contribution. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you.